Okay, I'm, I'm super interested, and this might be the story you were thinking I was going to tell. I'm super interested in the next section because it's, it links together a bunch of things, and, and I've already been credited as with being overly obsessed with VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And so I'm going to, in terms of the theory of this, quite simple. Complexity is, is one of the most things we're facing, a realization, the transparency of the complex world is what's happened now. We now all see it. It used to be complex, but we didn't see the drawings. And to, so, so you don't have to go and read any books on it. It's quite simple. There's only two things you do when you find yourself in a complex situation, and they are employ scaffolding and narrative. So these are very old concepts. I loved hearing scaffolding in the context of a tech talk earlier on. And that's what's the framework that sits around the thing you're going to try and dance with, the complex system. Stop trying to imagine you can put really firm things in the ground and then whatever you're building will emerge over time without negotiation or change. Put the scaffolding around it and let this dance with the system in the middle. Seems to work for tech as well as for human organizations. And secondly, you need to get good at narrative. A narrative is telling the story of what you believe is going on around here in a way that satisfies all the people who are looking. And what I love about this next talk is they are exemplars of scaffolding and narrative. So immediately acknowledging the complexity of the world they work in, and we all work in as well. But not only yeah. kind of understand that, it's given a, a special scaffolding around the beliefs and practices and approaches and mindsets that are a little different to what a traditional Western organization might do, but also narrative people as well, science fiction, fiction, games, all those kind of things. So yeah. what, a, what a combination. You, you do sure. the first intro. Yeah, very happy to uh, welcome Catherine Glethill Tucker. Um, she is uh, leading the First Nations Delivery Center at ThoughtWorks Australia, and she is also a digital rights activist. She serves on the board of Electronic Frontiers Australia, and she actively champions for human rights, especially in the digital age, and she's also very interested in writing speculative fiction. Fantastic, and that's the narrative I was talking about. Joel, Joel Davis, who's a uh, he and they. That's, that's neat, that's another different set of pronouns for us today. Senior business analyst uh, is a Gadigal and Dunguti man living in Nam, which is here in Melbourne, hailing from the Gadigal land. Joined ThoughtWorks this year, 2022, as a business analyst and iteration manager. That, you'd all know what that is. I don't have to explain what that's about. But has worked as a developer at the Nakan Nyagu, an indigenous-owned and operated consultancy as an analyst at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Would have been a contrast between those two cultures, I'm imagining. Uh, as a Gadigal language teacher at the Sydney Festival and has been engaged to participate in indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence funded workshops funded by the CIFAR as an independent researcher. That's, man, that's an amazing field, but we can't have a talk on that completely today, can we? Uh, in his free time, Joel is a serial hobbyist who enjoys diving deep into topics such as hacking and video game development. He sounds like someone I would very much like to go to a long lunch with. So welcome to the stage. Top controversial topic, responsible tech under digital colonialism. Lead us through. Yeah, thanks, Nigel. Thanks, Kira. Uh, and thanks everyone for sticking around. I hope you've enjoyed the day so far and enjoyed your XCOMF. We've got a couple more sessions this afternoon. Uh, so Joel and I are going to be talking about building responsible technology under digital colonialism. Firstly, I want to acknowledge that we're on Wurundjeri country today, whose sovereignty was never ceded. I want to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land and their continued connection to country. Our ancestors were the world's first scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians, and it is due to their continued connection to country and their knowledge and resilience that makes it possible for us to be here today. And I want to extend our respect to elders past and present and to all First Nations people here in the audience. First, I want to talk about language. So language imparts cultural values and frames our communication. It affects how we see the world, and the words we use and the language that we work with is very powerful. So who's familiar with this map? Great, so quite a few people, I thought so. You may have used it to identify whose land you're visiting. 
And, but this map has limitations. So this map was created by non-Indigenous peoples uh, to illustrate the numerous language groups across Australia. So these lines that have been drawn in an attempt to create boundaries are colonial. The idea that you can neatly separate people and place affects the way that we relate to each other and interpret history. And the concept of one single language belonging to a land is a relic of colonization. In reality, communities are multilingual. Prior to colonization, people spoke many languages, and these languages traversed borders. So what does it mean, then, when all of the code that we write is primarily written in one language and written in English? So according to the History of Programming Languages database, out of approximately 8,500 programming languages recorded, around 2,400 of those are developed in the United States, 600 in the UK, 160 in Canada, and 75 in Australia. In other words, over a third of all of these programming languages were developed in a Western country that primarily speaks English. So what happens when English is the lingua franca or common language of computing? Does it make any difference? And how would we measure that difference? I don't have a great answer today, but I asked these questions to provoke some reflection, to encourage everybody to question the default practices that we've assumed are immutable. Because English isn't neutral or culture-free, and so any English-written code is not neutral or culture-free either. English embodies the cultural baggage of its speakers as much as any other language. And it also informs how we solve problems. This is where I want to introduce this concept of digital colonialism. So over the last few decades, we've watched the Berners-Lee vision of the free and open web captured and commodified under a paradigm that can be characterized as digital colonialism. The use of digital infrastructure to mine, surveil, capture, package, and resell data, often from the global south for the purpose of profit. So Tuck and Yang describe colonization as the expropriation of fragments of indigenous worlds, animals, plants, and human beings, extracting them in order to transport them and build the wealth, the privilege, or feed the appetites of the colonizers. Now, the damage caused by colonizations that indigenous peoples have endured and continue to endure over time should not be trivialized by abstracting them into metaphor but Indigenous peoples may feel very familiar with the kinds of effects that we're experiencing under digital colonialism. So we need to be careful about falling into a mindset that code is somehow arbitrary or unbiased, because as we know, technology is not neutral. We like to think sometimes of technologies, and especially tools like machine learning or other kinds of algorithmic decision-making as purely rational and scientific because we've somehow abstracted ourselves away from their output. But anything built by humans or any human design system will exhibit bias. So as Joel tells us about their experience building the language application Huaki'i, I want us to think about the compromises the development team made or was forced to make because of these code language constraints, but also the ingenious choices that they made by applying a lens that was very mindful of this decolonial mindset and mindful of the, the adverse effects of coding in, in English. Oh, so I want to pay credit to the Indigenous Protocols in AI Working Group, which Joel and I have both participated in over the last few years. Most recently, the Working Group produced a paper called Out of the Black Box, Indigenous Protocols in AI, which establishes some broad principles and protocols for developing and relating to artificial intelligence. That was grounded in connection to country and connection to kin. So now I want to pass over to Joel to share more about their experience working with this working group and developing this language app. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, I am stoked to be here in Nam on the lands of the Wurundjeri people on which sovereignty was never ceded. 
Um, so, like Kat alluded to, I'm going to spin you all a yarn today. Uh, unfortunately, I only have a short 13 or so minutes to do it, um, and I have so much that I want to share with all of you. Um, so I'm going to take like a little bit of a different tact. Instead of telling you uh, everything that I know and everything that I experienced, um, which I want to do because I'm a little bit of a spewer that way, um, I am going to tell you about the context, share with you the uh, deep dive into one of the pieces of work that we did on this project, and then kind of give you a layout a smorgasbord of uh, uh, other parts of the application that we considered that we went into a similar depth with that I do not have the time to go into a similar depth with today. Um, and then kind of give you some closing thoughts. And then we'll um, answer some questions. And I'm sure there will be some questions. So um, as Kat mentioned, in 2019, uh, I was lucky enough to visit Hawaii on two separate occasions as part of the um, IP in AI working group. Um, and you can see me over there, second row to the right, giving cold steel. Um, and yeah, it was like an amazing time, amazing place, beautiful people, um, all internationals people from, uh, internationally indigenous people from around the world, you know, US, Canada, um, Aotearoa, and a pretty big showing from Australia as well. Um, unfortunately, Kat wasn't able to make it to those particular workshops, so totally missed out on like the one of the coolest parts of that whole engagement. Um, but I get to tell you all about it. <laughs> um, now, yeah, this happened in 2019, funded by CIFA, which is the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and I was invited. Um, you know, it was uh, how many years ago? It was 2019, three years ago. I was a scrappy young developer uh, who was also teaching uh, Sydney language classes um, through the Sydney Festival. Um, and I was invited to be part of the prototyping team, which looked like this. Um, four amazing, incredible people that I am very lucky to call my friends now. Um, starting left to right, we have Caleb Moses, who is an amazing Maori data scientist from Aotearoa. Caroline Runningwolf who is a Crow Nation woman, uh, who is one of those people who are just like so incredible that they're hard to define. Um, but she does everything and anything and uh, kind of ran project management on the prototype for us. Michael Runningwolf, her partner, who is a Northern Cheyenne man, um, who is an indigenous ethicist who works as a software developer and joined us as a developer on the prototyping team. We also had the amazing Dr. Noalani Arista, um, who is a strong Hawaiian woman who is a professor of US and Hawaiian uh, history at the University of Hawaii. Um, and then there's kind of me at the end not really knowing what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> in retrospect, I kind of did like a bit of BA, uh, IME kind of stuff, but also uh, front end um, and uh, yeah, sort of uh, uh, provided a bit of emotional support, I like to think. Um, so, you know, what is Huaki'i? What did we end up building? Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about how we arrived at what we thought we were going to build. Um, the goal of the prototyping team was to sort of build something tangible that we could all put our hands on that uh, kind of started to show us the path that AI and machine learning could take us on um, if we applied uh, indigenous protocols and an indigenous lens to the development um, of you know, AI and ML products. Um, it, it's a really tall order for five people in five days. <laughs> but um, yeah, we sort of, I think we ended up on a really good idea. When we were brainstorming ideas, um, I was very mindful to um, you know, bring my specialty to the conversation, which at the time was language. I was teaching um, Sydney language through the Sydney Festival, and um, you know, really mindful of the fact that there were you know, four continents and five or more language groups represented around this table of the prototyping team. Um, and 
we were all conversing in English. Um, and, uh, you know, I like to say that colonization is the uh, same, often the same story, just told in different ways. Um, this map is a map of uh, countries that have been colonized by Europe. Um, everything in green uh, has been colonized at one point or another by European powers, and everything in purple is uh, Europe, uh, somewhat. <laughs> Um, so, like, with that in mind, uh, I wanted to sort of um, drive the conversation into, uh, you know, how can AI and ML help us remove this lingua franca um, that is a common scar shared by all of our cultures and something that we use out of necessity. I would love to be giving this talk to all of you in Gadigal language or Dangari language or um, even the language of my Armenian immigrant uh, family as well. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in order to survive and pay rent, um, I am most eloquent in English. Uh, and even then, I can't pay rent on Gadigal land, which is Sydney City. Way too expensive. So I moved down here. <laughs> um, yeah, I was very mindful of all of that, so we decided to... Um, we, what we landed on was a image recognition application that presented the results of the image recognition in local indigenous language. Um, for all of the uh, indigenous mob in the room, alarm bells might be ringing, it's all good. Our purpose of building this app was purely, um, uh, uh, purely academic, and you know, there's various reasons why it hasn't become a full-fledged product that we released on the App Store and just let run rampant, um, and I'll go through some of those. Um, here's Caleb and I looking heaps deadly for like the product launch. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we did like a lot of couch programming like this, but um, didn't look, like looked more disheveled at the time. So I want to tell you about the UX and the UI as sort of a deep dive case study um, for this image recognition app. Because there are so many different moving parts about it that I'd like to share with you. Um, for the UX and UI, you know, when you're designing UX, you need to think about who is going to be using it. Um, for an app like this, it's most commonly like tourists um, that are going to be using it. So, uh, you know, most apps start with the assumption that when you open the app and you jump into the landing screen, you're going to be presented with the English language or whatever language is localized on the phone that is being used. Um, that's usually because you know tourists have a lot of money and profit motive. But we're kind of thinking more interestingly than how we can make the most money. Um, so that was not who we were designing for. We were designing for other indigenous peoples who might be visiting each other's lands and want to break down some of those communication barriers without having to resort to English as lingua franca. Um, so to that end, we couldn't really lean on um, you know, Google or uh, Apple's localization software, because um, last I checked, Gadigal, Cheyenne, Crow language, Maori, I don't know, maybe Maori these days, I don't know, um, aren't really offered as default localization options on those operating systems. And, you know, uh, five people in five days, we weren't going to be able to do all of the heavy lifting of traveling all around the world and um, doing all of the language work required and, you know, building the trust with those communities to um, get their permission and um, their knowledge to uh, build out all of the different languages that we wanted to put in there so that we could present words on the landing page. Our compromise was that we were going to strip written language out of the like front end, out of the primary functions altogether. Um, and, uh, you know, for the designers in the room, I completely understand if you like want to slap me at this point. There's a number of reasons why you don't want to do that, and like it's a kind of unique problem that we're trying to solve, right? You don't want to do. I'm not saying don't put language in your applications. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we want to strip all the language out and uh, replace it with symbols, um, and you know that sucks for a number of reasons. Uh, it sucks because of accessibility. Um, it sucks because there's kind of a really bad assumption that we're making that there's a level of indoctrination into um, 
culturally recognized symbols that happens when you have a mobile phone. Um, you know, we just kind of made the assumption, if you have a mobile phone, you know that a camera, a shutter button looks like this, and a chevron brings up a drop-down menu. Um, and yeah, those are bad assumptions to make. But we did it because uh, limited time and resources. Um, and yeah, that like a allowed us to diplomatically um, not assign a primary language into this, you know, a really complicated um, application that sat in the relationship between languages. There were two other big compromises that we made. One's a flow and effect of that. Um, and uh, uh, there's one that I can't remember, so I'll start with the other one. <laughs> oh, validation. That's right. If you don't have like a, enough language on the front end, it's really hard to validate that the result that you're receiving is the intended result, right? Um, you know, we wanted to strip the localized language out of the application. So, say you point the application at a teapot, and you get back a local language word you just kind of have to assume that it's the teapot. Um, and there's a, that's a big assumption to make, um, considering you know, the, the accuracy of image recognition and the like, cultural assumptions that you're baking into. It, does this culture see a teapot? Does it prioritize potentially the tea itself or a, a ceremony? Like, does that, is that indicative of ceremony instead? Um, and you, know, you might walk away from that encounter as someone who doesn't know that language, um, thinking that you can effectively communicate to someone, hey, I know what the word for teapot is, can I buy a teapot? When you might be saying like, hey, can I buy a tea ceremony? Or can I buy uh, some really nice tea? Um, so you know, the, the, lots of problems with that. Um, the other issue uh, as well is that um, you know, how we presented uh, uh, the results depended a lot on the back end that we used, which was an out-of-the-box image recognition um, machine learning software. And um, you, know, it, you send it an image, and it sends back a word. And then we uh, you know, have a translation layer, and then we present the word in the local indigenous language. Um, and one of the really interesting things about that is that uh, I know, like, personally, my language, the Gadigal language, wasn't a written language. It was a spoken language for tens of thousands of years and had never been written. So suddenly, you were presenting a verbal language in Unicode with like a kind of obscure orthography for how you represent those sounds with English letters. Um, you know, certainly not ideal. And I really don't even know where to start with like how you would have image recognition return of a verbal response without having to do the like uh, language to you know text to speech kind of stuff. So if you have any idea of that you know please let me know. Um, so that was the deep dive. Let me now lay it all out on the table for you. We had a few. Uh, we had a lot of other problems that we dove this deep into. Um, one really good one was like geolocation and geofencing. You know, Kat touched on the fact that a lot of the times, especially for language, the borders that we now place on land in this geopolitical landscape didn't exist prior to colonization. Maybe still don't exist the way that they're recorded. Is it appropriate for us to be reinforcing those boundaries digitally? And um, you know, how do we empower local communities to make those calls themselves? How do we provide autonomy? without applying authority? Um, you know, how do we empower local communities to use this as a tool to empower their communities without handing the keys to you know, one particular organization that might not have the community's best interests at heart? How do we source language respectfully? And logistically, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of indigenous languages. And you know, you, you, First knee-jerk reaction is let's apply a bureaucratic process to that, you know, some kind of standardized system, and that won't work for all cultures, of course. Um, the front-end framework, uh, I did a lot of the front-end in uh, Google's old uh, Ionic um, framework, and it's just like, you know, how you think about how you categorize things and present things to users, and the relationship between users and the translation layer and the back-end are all informed by the language used, and that, you know, impacts that impacts solutioning. 
Um, I talked a bit about the recognition software, and you know, one really last, really hard question. Is it even appropriate to share this much language without the context of being in a learning environment or having a local language person present? Um, you know, that's kind of a question that each language has to um, answer individually if they want to answer it at all. Um, you know, any one of these questions uh, can be a, you know, a hard no that prevents uh, it being a product that goes to market or whatever. Um, my personal take on it coming out the other end is that if you solve one or a couple of these problems without solving the, all of them, or you know, the culture that sits on top that informs a lot of these issues, it's just different layers of harm reduction. And harm reduction is good. But it's not perfect. It's not you know, ideal. Um, so that's it for me. So I've, I know I've eaten into question time. Just kind of got on a roll. <laughs> um, thank you, Kat. Thank you, ThoughtWorks. Thank you, audience. Thank you.